Welcome to the Rock Newman Show. It's the Rock Newman Show. And now, The Rock Newman Show. Welcome back, folks. I am Rock Newman. And in this hour, we have Obi Egbuna. And in the next hour, we're going to be celebrating 55 years of love and half smokes. The story <laughs> of Ben's Chili Bowl. Uh, the matriarch of that incredible Washington, D.C. family, uh, Virginia Ali, will be joining us. And uh, we're excited about that, and I'm also excited right now to introduce you to uh, my next guest. Uh, Obi Egbuna is a teacher, a journalist, and a children's playwright. He, uh, he writes for the, uh, Zimbabwe, uh, the main Zimbabwe newspaper. Um, his father uh, is uh, by the same name, uh, Obi Egbuna, who was a Pan-Africanist of uh, spanning many, many, many years ago. They both uh, spent a very long time um, with someone that I have such admiration for, uh, respect. Um, I uh, talked about it uh, publicly uh, through via Facebook <laughs> a week or so ago, and I talked about my incredible admiration for Stokely Carmichael, uh, better, uh, also known as Kwame Toure. And one of my, uh, one of the responses that I got said, well, man, you ought to have Obi Egbuna on your show. Uh, he can talk about his time with uh, Stokely. He can talk about his father's time. I talked about having such incredible admiration for the ideology and the goal of Stokely Carmichael, which was, if I understand it correctly, he is a Pan-Africanist to the core of his being. Yes. Obi Egbona, welcome to the Rock Newman Show. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. Really. If we can start here. Sure. Can you give what you think is the most appropriate definition of Pan-Africanism? Um, most definitely. Um, Pan-Africanism is the total liberation and unification of the African continent um, under um, scientific socialism. Um, hoping that um, Africans all over the world um, embrace that goal, not only on the continent of Africa, but in the diaspora, which would mean that the Africans in Australia who've been there 80,000 years embrace that goal. Africans in the UK embrace that goal. Africans in India, where there are 160 million of us, embrace that goal. And Africans in every corner of the continent, the southern region of Africa, the eastern region of Africa, the northern region of Africa, um, and the western region of Africa embrace that goal, regardless of our um, religious and spiritual makeup, regardless of our economic makeup, we all make a genuine commitment to that goal and strive towards that goal, even if we are not um, privileged to witness it take fruition. To the goal of? Pat, one unified, liberated African continent um, moving in a socialist direction, just like those who came before us wanted it to ultimately be. And ironically, the first time the term is used is out of Trinidad by Henry Sylvester Williams, the same place that Brother Kwame was born, June 29th, 1941. Yes. He, uh, and when did he coin the phrase? He coined the phrase that um, right before the 20th century, mm -hmm. right before the 20th century. And so many others um, used you know, the phrase and helped develop the phrase and gave some clarity to the objective itself. How do, how do those in the struggle? Yes equate the des your desire mm -hmm. to what has happened with the state of Israel? Well, well of course, um, and it's funny that you bring that up because one of the um, main um, areas that I work with Brother Kwame Ture around <clears throat> was establishing something called the WWAAZF, the Worldwide African Anti-Zionist Front, which was created in Tripoli, Libya in 1990. And one of the things that he told me, he said that his generation um, had pushed aggressively to assure that we and the Palestinian people maintained an unbreakable bond. 
He talked to um, Ethel Miner, who worked with Malcolm X and the Organization of Afro-American Unity, ended up, um, and then the Nation of Islam before that, ended up working very closely with SNCC. She developed a paper called The Palestinian Problem, and that was the reason that the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee came out against the Six-Day War, which many people felt led to the demise of that organization. And when he gave me that history, he also talked about the fact that if you go back and take a look at Malcolm's history, Malcolm X is the first person to develop a relationship with a gentleman named Ahmed Shukari. For those who don't know who Ahmed Shukari is that are listening in, he's the founder of the Palestinian Liberation Organization. And um, when Muhammad Speaks started, under, when Malcolm was the national spokesman of the Nation of Islam, what you see today in the final call, the Middle East Report, controlled by Mr. Ali Baghdadi, that stems from a segment dealing with the Palestinian question that Malcolm arranged for the paper to consistently cover. So what Kwame was telling us is our generation would have to show that Zionism is a direct enemy of African people. And of course, we know that Israel bombed, tried to bomb Egypt off the face of the map during that six-day war. We know that when Algeria got its independence, it was Israel who stood up in the United Nations and failed to recognize their sovereignty. They did the same thing to Tunisia. Israel openly supported apartheid and not only what we commonly refer to as South Africa, they helped the Rhodesians try to maintain control over what we call today Zimbabwe, over what we call today Zambia. They aided um, the Germans in trying to maintain a colony of Namibia and they did the same thing in Mozambique and Angola. Many people feel that off the continent of Africa, one of the safe havens for us based on dealing with true human rights in its purest form, free education, free health care, is none other than Cuba. And Israel is one of the only countries in the world that maintains the position that the blockade against Cuba, that over 180 countries vote unequivocally against at the United Nations every year, it is Israel that stands firm with the United States on that particular question. So we would have to say without apology, without hesitation, and we have the facts to prove it, that everywhere Africans make progress, it is Israel that always stands up and tries to undermine and sabotage our genuine efforts to have self-determination in our lifetime and eventually for future generations to have it as well, if we have the ability to maintain it, that is. Yeah. Well, I would say that <clears throat> certainly if anyone, is, if anyone here of the Jewish persuasion mm -hmm. were listening to you, yes. maybe not everybody, okay. but certainly many, would hear the comment that you just made yes. and said, wow, mm. that's, a, that's a rabid anti-Semite. And you would say, I would say that that's, I would say I'm the one ins insulted because I condemn Zionism, a atheist political philosophy that does not deal with God at all. I did not say a thing about Judaism. As a matter of fact, true Jews would appreciate it because Jews understand that Zionism has stained their religion. How can an atheist political philosophy denying the existence of God claim to be in pursuit of land that uh, God chose for their people. It was the Balfour Declaration in 1914 that Lord, Lord Arthur Balfour was British. Theodore Herzl, the creator of the Zionist movement in 1897, like we said, he's an atheist. They were the only grouping of people that had cologne. And remember, the Zionist movement is created 12 years after the, um, conf the Berlin Conference, where Africa was sliced up like a Papa John's or Pizza Hut pizza for the taking of our former colonial slave masters. Them being left out of the equation, they wanted some land of their own to colonize. They originally looked at Kenya. They originally looked at Uganda. They originally looked at a place in Switzerland. Then to um, support the mythology of, um, that's at the root and foundation of the Jewish religion, which, by the way, Africans gave to the world. So, and because of our history, knowing that one of the most atrocious crimes committed by our former colonial and slave masters was not just the land they raped, not just the land they plundered, not just the human resources they exploited with no pity and no mercy, but the fact that they did it in the name of God. The Arab slave trade was done in the name of Islam. So one of the things, us being arguably the most spiritually diverse people on earth, we feel there are two things that human beings do not have the luxury of ever doing conquering a people in the name of God and using God as an excuse not to fight against being conquered. I personally believe the latter is worse. So as a philosophy, yes. a, a, as a philosophy mm -hmm. doctrine, it is not about being anti 
Jewish. Not at all. It's anti A, reli a religion that we gave to the world? Of course not. Okay. It is in the name of Judaism that we fight against Zionism. Say that again. It is in the name of Judaism and any other authentic form of spirituality or religion, if you will, that we fight against a ruthless group of colonialists and imperialists who commit their atrocities in the name of a religion. Okay. Let's go, um, let's, let's, let's talk about your dad. Sure. Your dad was a powerhouse. He was an organizer. Mm. He was early, he was an early proponent of Pan-Africanism. Mm -hmm. And you know, at, on its face, mm -hmm. you know, the, what I call the lofty but beautiful gold <laughs> of Pan-Africanism mm -hmm. is something that I would just think that people of good conscience mm. could embrace yeah. around the world. And people of good conscience don't just come in one color, of course. <laughs> Not at all, no. So, your father was very rooted yes. in that philosophy. Still is. Tell us where he got it from and, oh, wow. and, 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 and folks who might not know, might not ever heard that funny sounding name, <laughs> Obi Egbuna. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about your dad, where he got his mm. political activist um, energy. Okay. Uh, talk, talk to us about your dad. Well, I mean, this is, this is the thing about that, of course. I mean, he, he's a novelist, a playwright. And he's the founder of the Black Panther Party in the UK, in Britain. For right. many people who thought that that was an exclusive dynamic to the United States, nothing can be further than the Both truth. The, 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 the powers, the powers yeah, in Great exactly. Britain didn't quite like your dad. No, so much. not at the all. The powers didn't. And um, what? So he was there. The powers um, don't usually like folks that speak truth to no, them. No, that's true. Okay. Like you. <laughs> so the thing about that is, um, yes, he, so he was there. And they eventually had an organization called the Universal Colored People's Association. But to give it um, more direction, they gravitated to the slogan, Black Power, first um, espoused by Frederick Douglass, but made, made popular in the 1960s. So right around the same time that um, Kwame Ture and Charles Hamilton wrote the book Black Power Here, mm -hmm. right around that same period, um, he wrote a book called Destroy This Temple about the Black Power Movement in Britain. So this was going on simultaneously. But the beautiful thing about Britain, because when we take a look at Malcolm X's autobiography and he talks about his conversation with Osage for Kwame Nkrumah, and they say that Ghana is the fountainhead of Pan-Africanism, as we said, off the continent of Africa, Trinidad is a fountainhead for sure, but Britain has an incredible history also. This is where George Padmore cut his teeth. This is where C.L.R. James cut his teeth. So what happened is then you had many of the um, people who became the preeminent organizers of key liberation movements throughout Africa who first got their orientation through political circles in London. As a matter of fact, um, their efforts to create the Black Panther Party come 20 years after the Fifth Pan-African Congress, which many people consider the most significant, that was organized in Manchester, England in 1945. So they had um, a springboard to work from. And at the same time, he's always focused on Nigeria. So right around that same period, as Nigeria, you, where yes, he was born, where he was your, born, your, your father he was, was born, born in Nigeria, Nigeria. Yes. and they were focusing on the Igbo Biafran War, cousins killing cousins, sisters killing sisters, brothers killing brothers. So he wrote this piece called um, "The Murder of Nigeria," and one of the first people to read it outside of England was none other than Osage for Kwame Nkrumah, and Kwame Nkrumah fell in love with the piece, reached out to him, began to develop a relationship with him. At that time, Nkrumah had just been overthrown by the CIA and British imperialism in Ghana. The U.S. On, government would on his do way like to they Vietnam, like on his way to Vietnam to present a proposal to end the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. So, in addition to Muhammad Ali losing his belt, us losing Martin Luther King for dealing with the Vietnam War, we lost modern Africa's first independent nation to defeat colonial rule on the battlefield. We must incorporate that into the discussion when we discuss our position in Vietnam. Now, going back to this, they start working together. So Nkrumah says, there's a young man that I just started corresponding Your, your dad with. And, and Kwame Nkrumah, Nkrumah started working started with started corresponding. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Nkrumah had a journal called Africa and the World. He wanted my, because Nkrumah was a big proponent, as you know, of papers. Yes. When he was here in this country and started what we still see today as the African Student Unions at HBCUs and on predominantly white campuses, he created that. They had a paper called The African Interpreter 
when he went to Britain, they started a paper called The New African. And of course, he created multiple papers during his nine-year run as the president of Ghana. So they created this journal. And he told my father, I want you to meet someone who reminds me a lot of you. His name is Stokely Carmichael at that point. Not too long after that, for those who read Stokely Speaks from Black Power Back to Pan-Africanism, which is Kwame's speeches from about 1966 to 1972, okay. there's a speech in there called The Dialectics of Liberation, which he, when he spoke in London. And my father and him shared the panel that night, and they were introduced to each other. So from that moment on, they maintained a relationship all the way up to Kwame's passing in November of 1998. And uh, so that's how they got linked together. They're the link, they were linked together through Nkrumah. And Nkrumah, who was also a link between Dr. Martin Luther King and Malcolm X, and Nkrumah, who was also a link between W.E.B. Du Bois and Marcus Garvey, because Nkrumah, being a philosophy student, said the one book that changed his life was the philosophy and opinions of Marcus Garvey, yet he maintained that Du Bois was the father of Pan-Africanism. Yeah. You know, I want to come back. We're going to go to break, but I, sure. I want to come back before we leave this area. Mm -hmm. I want I want to touch on your statement that Kwame Nkrumah mm -hmm. was the link between Malcolm X and Martin Luther King. Oh, no question. When we come back on The Rock Newman Show, Thanks. from Busboys and Poets, the Langston Hughes Room, we'll be back in a moment. <laughs> Leprechaun Tim Pohanka from Pohanka Nissan and Pohanka Hyundai. It's hard to be down on your luck when you're Virginia's first choice for new Nissan and Hyundais, but I need to sell 60 cars this week. Right now, I'll pay you big bucks for your good luck. Bring down any good luck charm you've gotten based on the sale price of the car you choose. I'll give you up to $4,777 off any nicer, newer car this week. Today, your lucky penny is worth plenty, up to $4,777 off any nicer, newer car you want. Stop moping and hoping you'll get approved. With my For the People credit approval process, the banks are looking to get lucky and lend to you, even if you've been turned down before. Bring me any good luck charm and I'll give you up to $4,777 off any nicer, newer car today. Hurry, once I get rid of 60 cars, the luck runs out. All offers require bank approval, so call us at 1-800-POHANKA, visit Poanka Nissan and Poanka Hyundai on Route 1 in Fredericksburg, or better yet, log on to timpoankaforthepeople.com. And when we make a deal, I promise it'll be your lucky day. I'm Tim Poanka, and I'm a leprechaun for the people. Hello, everybody. I'm Rock Newman from The Rock Newman Show. And I am absolutely flattered to have as one of my fine advertisers the DMV's greatest corporate citizen. Who am I talking about? I'm talking about the Pohanka Automotive Group. If you have any automotive needs whatsoever, if you want to sell your car, buy a car, trade in your car, have your car serviced, whatever you need, see my good friends at the Pohanka Automotive Group you will be well taken care of, I promise. I'm Rock Newman, I might be there. Come on down and see our good friends at Pohanka Automotive Group. And now, The Rock Newman Show. Welcome back, folks. This is Rock Newman. Today is August the 17th, 2013. 
My guest in studio at Busboys and Poets in the Langston Hughes room is Obi Egbuna. And uh, we just spent 20 scintillating minutes with him, and we've got, uh, we'll go to the top of the hour here. Um, before we left, um, you made mention about Kwame Nkrumah. Yes. And that he was the link between several giants in the civil rights movement, the yeah. Pan-African movement, and otherwise. Mm. You said that, he, that Kwame Nkrumah was a link between Malcolm X and Martin Luther King. Please explain. Oh, very simply. Um, well, many people don't, uh, unfortunately don't know that um, Martin Luther King went to Africa before um, Mar Malcolm X. And he went to Ghana to um, celebrate Ghana's independence. This is a very important relationship for us to chronicle and always do be, uh, highlight because um, when many people talk about Dr. King, they talk about um, the influence of Gandhi on him. They talk about the influence of Thoreau on him, but not the influence of Nkrumah on him. And it conveys this message that Africans must look outside their culture, outside their experience for philosophical direction. Nothing can be further from the truth. Nkrumah, I mean, King being a student of nonviolence, what Nkrumah called positive action, he, had to, he felt obliged to go there. And he told Nkrumah in their meeting the same strategy we used in Montgomery to uh, dismantle the bus operation because of racism and segregation. You used the same tactics that made the British Empire come crumbling down in Africa. I have a lot to learn from you. So, it, and of course, Malcolm X um, taking the position, being very critical of the uh, March on Washington, being very critical of nonviolent protest at that time, it shows that he, was, he did not have a problem with marching. He did not have a problem with striking, demonstrating, and boycotting, but the target of the efforts. Because if he supports Nkrumah, who used the same tactics King was using in the South, the same tactics that SNCC was using in the South, Corps was using in the South, and they overthrow British colonialism in Ghana, and he says, and Krum is his favorite president, he goes there and says that Ghana's the fountainhead of Pan-Africanism, that states everything. And interestingly enough, the same way that, um, and when Mal Malcolm talked, and but King both critical, King, in his letter to the Birmingham jail, very suspicious of white liberals, moderates as he called them. Malcolm X saying the only difference between Democrats and Republicans is their foxes and wolves. Both of them understood we needed political parties of strength. What makes Nkrumah unique is when we take a look at the um, anti-colonial movement in Africa, he did not establish a movement in Ghana, they established a party, the Convention People's Party, 1949. Yeah. Three years before that, Akme Sekouture in Guinea, who the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan calls his political father, he established a party, the Democratic Party of Guinea. As we're sitting here having this conversation today, this is the 40th anniversary of Emil Cabral's assassination, the founder of the Party for the Independence of Guinea and Cape Verde. So here we have three political parties that were the engines behind the anti-colonial movement in three strategic nations in Africa. They did not have movements, they did not have unions, they did not have fronts. They created parties. So Malcolm appreciated that. King created that. But King Nkrumah is also, like we said, the bridge between Du Bois and Garvey. Let's pivot a little bit, but sure. not too far. <laughs> There's something that is called, that is very prestigious, is mm -hmm. perceived to be very, very prestigious throughout the land. Mm -hmm. It's called the Rhodes Scholarship. Oh, OK. And I'd like to talk about, I'd like to talk about who that was named after. Ooh. I'd like to talk about the individual. Okay. And if a little bit of research <laughs> serves me properly, there's someone mm -hmm. named Cecil Rhodes. Yeah. Tell As he liked to say, Cecil John Rhodes. Cecil John Rhodes, yeah. <laughs> yes. Tell us about Cecil Rhodes. Oh, he's the creator of the British um, South African Company whose uh, slogan, since we use slogans and mantras in corporate USA, most of them live or die by their slogans, his happened to be from Cape to Cairo. 
And if you understand Africa geographically, that's the top of Africa to the bottom. So he let it be known that the goal and objective of his company was to conquer all of Africa. And his com what kind of company did he have? Uh, it was a, under the relationship, it was a shipping company. It was a navigation company. It was an ex a company that was supposed to do tourism and explora explorations and all that. But the true goal of it was to conquer, rape, and plunder Africa. And two um, countries were named after him. What, is Northern Rod what was Northern Rhodesia to then is Zambia today. What was Southern Rhodesia then was Zimbabwe. And he never lived in, and he's buried in Zimbabwe, but he never lived there. He never went there, but he insisted that he be buried there. And he made his, um, he, he hung out in what is called South Africa on the other side of the Limpopo River. So that was his goal. And interestingly enough, people take pride, I think, in the academic aspect of what that scholarship is supposed to entail. But the same way that you would like to see the Redskins name change, the people should consider in the name of peace, in the name of democracy, in the name of true human rights, they should consider changing that name. Uh, it would be, we would look you, at that very you, favorably uh, as a people. You, uh, you, you write for Zimbabwe. National newspaper, National, the Herald. Yes, National, I do. News, National newspaper. Uh -huh. What is the sentiment of Zimbabweans about how do they feel about Cecil Rhodes? Oh, I mean, he, he, he's, he's the man that came and um, orchestrated the conquering of their country. But um, they feel that it's a process that they had to go through. These are people who look at his, their interpretation of history as rooted in their fighting spirit. So while they know the atrocities he committed, while they know the atrocities that Ian Smith committed, who said when, he, when the Universal Declaration of Independence was established in 1961, and he was asked by a foreign journalist, when will you have a discussion with the black Africans um, about controlling this land? He said, perhaps in a thousand years. So how is that different from George Wallace saying segregation today, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever? forever. So they, they look at it through their fight. So that when they think of Cecil Rhodes, they think of Mbuya Nehanda. Nehanda was a woman that organized the first armed uprising against the British in 1896. And I think this is important for your listeners. In Zimbabwe, the noose is a symbol of resistance, not a symbol of genocide and terrorism. And the reason is because when they hung Nehanda, they asked her, do you have any last words? And she said in the national language of Shona, mafupa angu achu muka. I'll repeat that, mafupa angu achu muka, which means in English, my bones will rise. So she was saying, you'll kill me today, but my fighting spirit will live through my people. So it took 84 years, but from 1966 to 1980, they fought a protracted armed struggle against the second most powerful colonial army ever assembled in Africa, and they emerged victorious. So when they look at Cecil Rhodes, they look at him in the context of Nehanda, in the context of Robert Mugabe, Joshua Nkomo, Herbert Chitepo, Josiah Tongogar, and many of the giants who put their life on the line for Zimbabwe to be reclaimed by Africans. Somewhere shortly after uh, Rhodesia, became Zimbabwe. Yes. Somewhere I think was, it was within the year, because mm -hmm. there was a lot of excitement around uh, about the liberation yes. of, of, of Rhodesia and renaming it Zimbabwe. Yes. Uh, Robert Mugabe came and spoke on the campus of Howard University. Oh, yeah. I was in the audience that day. Mm -hmm. um, it was one of the most inspirational messages and speeches mm. that I've ever heard. Wow. And he opened his, I remember at one point during the speech, he opened his arms up mm. and invited everyone in attendance that day. He said, I know all of you won't make it, but I want you to know that you're all invited to come home. Mm. Come home. Yes. Um, Robert Mugabe now is portrayed as an absolute pariah by <laughs> What, what Sarah Palin calls the lamestream media and, oh, and, wow. and, 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 and most other media. Mm -hmm. um, talk to us about Mugabe. Uh, uh, accurate portrayal, terrible portrayal. Talk to us about how he's portrayed here in the West and the realities oh. that he has to deal with at home. Predictable portrayal. Predictable. Um, one of his blessings is he's impervious to the criticism. He knows how he is perceived in Africa. He knows how he's perceived in progressive circles around the world. 
and he knows that his contemporary Nelson Mandela, as much as the United States European Union, U EU alliance claims to love him, only removed him from the U.S. Uh, list of terrorists a, a few years ago. This is uh, so. If their favorite head of state, the head of state who they're most politically comfortable with, if he was still considered a terrorist while they were doing photo ops with him, while they were in his living room eating his food, someone like President Mugabe, who has always taken what they consider an extreme position, a defiant position, dealing with the question of land, dealing with the question of self-determination, dealing with the question of foreign policy, he could care less. So they can continue to try to demonize him, but he knows that when it comes to African history, when, when we will have the last word on our history. Taylor Branch can't have the last word on Martin Luther King. Clint Eastwood can't have the last word on Charlie Parker. So the Washington Post, the Voice of America, the CIA, the Democratic Party, the Republican Party, the Labor Party in Britain, they cannot and will not have the last word on Robert Gabriel Mugabe. That we guarantee. My wife, um, a few years ago, just a, f just a few years ago, spent uh, spent about 10 days in Zimbabwe. Mm. And on, you know, daily she would report Mm -hmm. about the incredible beauty of the land. Yes. She went to she went up to Victoria Falls. I think she went over into Zambia at one point, but she went up to she went to Victoria Falls and was like okay. it's just one of the most beautiful places on on this planet. But <clears throat> in the city in in uh, uh she's I think she's pretty sure she stayed in Harare. Yeah. She stayed in the capital. Mm -hmm. And um they gave her some money. Mm -hmm. And she called, and my, my godson was with her. Mm -hmm. And she said, we're both sitting here, and we've got millions of dollars. What, what, <laughs> what, what's the currency? Um, they, they use Zim. dollars. Zim, we, Zim dollars. We, we, Zim dollars. We, we, got, we, got, we, just, we just get, we <laughs> trade, we traded like $200, and we're Zim, yeah. almost billionaires. We got all, right. the, all of these millions. Mm -hmm. So the, the economy continues to, to teeter and to, and to struggle. To what extent has international policy played mm. on the continual huh. struggle and poverty in, 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 in Zimbabwe? In 2001... In a land so rich. In, in 2000, well, first of all, we have to go back to the whole question of, um, since you brought up when you uh, met, when you saw President Mugabe, I was in the audience as well. I was a little boy. I was going to say, you had to be hey, a little boy. I was little, about little, 11. Cool. And what ended up happening is um, that same day, he went to see um, Ronald Reagan. Yes. And Ronald Reagan told him that the Lancaster negotiations would not be honored. For your audience who doesn't know, um, because of the diplomatic work of um, Ambassador Andrew Young, um, then representing the Carter administration, an agreement was brokered between Britain, the United States, and Zimbabwe. At that time, Prime Minister Robert Mugabe and um, Joshua Nkomo, affectionately referred to his father Zimbabwe because of his role in the liberation struggle there. May he rest in peace. Mm -hmm. um, between 1980 and 1990, the land was supposed to be transferred that the Europeans had occupied to the indigenous people. Um, Carter signed this agreement. Margaret Thatcher signed this agreement. Reagan comes in immediately and says he's under no obligation to honor the agreement since he wasn't an original broker of the agreement. Margaret Thatcher paid overtures to the agreement. John Major paid overtures to the agreement. By the time the Bill Clinton wannabe Tony Blair comes into the equation, he says he will not honor the agreement. So what happens is we're 20 years removed, which is as South Africa is approaching its 20th year flag independence, people must pay attention. Um, President Mugabe was, um, he saw um, an in intensification of criticism, tactical criticism, that this issue needed to be addressed. Mm -hmm. And, and so, not an honoring of, I'm going to use no, this term, no, no. not so, an honoring of the treaty. Exactly. Right, not, right. And, and interestingly... That, and interesting, somewhere in history, in the United yes. States history, that has and, happened before. And, and, oh, yes. And interestingly enough, um, as we know, for Africans, um, bashing Republicans is almost a, as much of a tradition as turkeys on Thanksgiving and fireworks on the 4th of July. Yet, two, through Reagan's two terms, we say nothing. Jesse Jackson's campaigns, 84 to 88, that's not a priority on his foreign policy agenda. Um, everything we were doing is like we were ignoring this. So in 2000, their backs are against the wall. They aggressively develop a campaign called the Land Reclamation Program. Mm -hmm. President Mugabe isn't even in the country, by the way. He's in Cuba at the G77 summit. Mm -hmm. How people start showing up saying, could you please exit my great-grandmother's house? You know, so this eventually happens. 
And the response from the United States is to create the Zimbabwe Democracy and Economic Recovery Act of 2001, sanctions. And um, Britain, of course, initiated it. The United States followed suit. Bush walked it through the White House. Um, the late Congressman Donald Payne of the Congressional Black Caucus, yeah. he walks it through Congress. John Kerry walks it through the Senate. Hillary Clinton walks it through the Senate. The no member of the Congressional Black Caucus voted against the sanctions. Five abstained. Cynthia McKinney, Corin Brown, the late Stephanie Tubbs Jones, Carolyn Kilpatrick, and Bobby not, Rush. did not vote against Not this. one Congress. Congressional Black They came five votes short of voting unanimously. Right. The five abstained. Nine uh, Republicans of European ancestry voted against it, and two Democrats. People can look it up. So this compromise Zimbabwe, the same sanctioning that has left 2 million people dead in Iraq, 500,000 children since 1990, the same type of sanctioning in the form of a blockade imposed on Cuba by the Kennedy administration that has cost Cuba $100 billion since 1962, money that could go towards their free education program, their free health care program, and whatnot. So the objective was to implode Zimbabwe's economy, compromise the agriculture infrastructure, compromise the educational system, which ha Zimbabwe has Africa's highest literacy rate, 97 percent. So these, and compromise their efforts in their courageous fight against HIV AIDS, where in the region ravaged by the pandemic, as you know, they've had the most significant decline since 2000. But um, the United States and Britain blocked their access to global fund and their applications in the second, third, fourth, and sixth round of century were rejected. So this was diplomatic terrorism. The Bush administration maintained the policy, and unfortunately, the Obama administration and President Obama's first four years may extended the sanctions every March through from in 2008, 9, 10, 11, and 12. And based on Kerry's attack of the elections, the most significant political defeat that our former colonial masters have experienced in Africa, by the way, this century so far, uh, they discredited the elections, even though they told Andrew Young personally, if the elections go, aren't violent and if the elections are democratic, they'll uh, lift the sanctions. But we knew that they weren't going to do that. Yeah. It'll only come when we pressure them to do so. Folks, we attempt to bring you the truth. It might be a harsh truth. But on The Rock Newman Show, we try to give you the real truth. We'll be back in just a moment. To all my friends in the DMV, I am Rock Newman from the Rock Newman Show. I want to tell you about the MGM Grand National Harbor, the most exciting project to come to the District of Maryland or Virginia in quite some time. You're going to have great fun. Come on down, support this project with all you have. It is going to be wonderful for the area. We're going to increase our tax base. We're going to get funding for the police department, for ambulance, for fire, for education. It is really a project that is going to benefit our area. Folks, we want to support in a very strong DMV kind of way this great project from the MGM Grand National Harbor.
baby drives a pro handcuff. The weekend is here, and no matter what the weather's like outside, you'll find the deals inside here in the beautiful showroom of the all-new Pohanka Hyundai in Capitol Heights during their giant Markdown Madness sale. Smart shoppers know that every new Hyundai in Pohanka comes with Hyundai Assurance and America's best 10-year, 100,000-mile powertrain warranty. But why don't you tell them about the Markdown sale, Joe? I'll be happy to, Kim. Folks, shop around on the web, and you'll see lease payments on a new 2013 Elantra GLS at $179 a month. Today at Pohanka Hyundai, $99 a month. That's right, a $99 payment on a brand-new Elantra. And 89 a month on a new 2013 Accent GLS Automatic. How do they do it, Joe? It must be the volume, Kim. A brand new building, hundreds of new Hyundais, and Pohanka's low payment and easy credit programs are designed to get everybody driving. But you have to get here today. Rush to the giant Markdown Madness sale at exit 13 off the Capitol Beltway. Pohanka Hyundai, king of the Beltway. All financing for a limited term on approved HMF credit. My baby drives a Pohanka. And now, The Rock Newman Show. Welcome back, folks. Uh, this is, will be our uh, final segment with Obi Egbuna. Coming up in the next hour, we're going to be celebrating again 55 years of love and half smokes. The story of Ben's Chili Bowl, the iconic restaurant on U Street in Northwest Washington, D.C., that when I say iconic, it has become international. It has become internationally famous. It is a it is a tourist attraction. Uh, Barack Hussein Obama won the presidency uh, in 2008, and about two minutes after he won the presidency, he was at Ben's Chili Bowl having a half smoke. You go by there, you see Barack Obama celebrities all over the world. They're having a they're having a, a, a anniversary celebration on Thursday. That is going to be hosted by Bill Cosby, and we're going to have in the coming in, coming up in the 11 o'clock hour. Uh, Virginia Ali, who is the matriarch, who has been there from the very beginning. She's uh, been through the trials and tribulations and, uh, and now is, uh, has, a, has an operation that is truly an international icon. Hmm. But we're going to continue here with Obi Egbuna, who's a teacher, a journalist, and a children's playwright. And you hmm. wrote something called Same Neighborhood. It references and deals with Colin Powell and Kwame Ture. Stokely Kwame Michael, Kwame Ture. Yes. Tell us about that book, why you did it, what you hoped to communicate um, w with that, with that uh, initiative. Well, yes, it, it was a children's play, uh, not yet a book yet. We've, we've done seven. Um, we have a children's history and theater company called Mass Emphasis children between 5 and 18 years old, where we simply use theater as a vehicle to um, teach them their history. Um, that was our sixth play. It's called Same Neighborhood, Different Perspectives, a conversation between General Colin Powell and Kwame Ture. Um, the original inspiration for it was um, in 1995, um, I was riding with Kwame to, he was invited to speak by the Black Student Union at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. And when we picked him up at the airport, we had a Santana tape in the car. And it was Santana playing um, Ola Tunji's um, rendition of the Yoruba song from the classic 1964 Drums of Passion album. And Kwame was like, uh, is that Ola Tunji or Santana? And I said, that's Santana. And he was like, oh, you got to go to the root. And so I just started laughing. And I told him that both tapes were on my dresser. And I originally wanted to bring the Ola Tunji, but I snatched the <laughs> Santana tape by right. mistake. Right. And he told me then, he said, you know, young blood, he said, um, this Pan-African stuff that we're talking about politically, it's been in our culture long before we're trying to catch up. Yeah. And uh, so at some point, I just realized that one of the biggest struggles that we have as a people is to make our cultural and political expression synonymous. And so this is how, um, through working in the classroom for 23 years now, we have found theater to be perhaps the most engaging method to expose our young people to this history. Notice we said exposure, because if there's a thinner line than the line between love and hate, it's the line between exposure and imposition. We seek to impose nothing on our children, but expose them to all that we're capable of exposing them to. So um, we decided to do this play because we know that the two most decorated traditions in our community, if you will, are the church and the military. 
probably the, a, the best Jekyll Hyde scenario, politically speaking, you'll find anywhere we are in the world. So we wanted to look at how Africans get um, exposed to those institutions. And, but at the same time, our most sacred tradition is our tradition of resistance. So Kwame Ture, amongst his generation, is arguably the symbol of our tradition of resistance, arguably the finest organizer we've ever produced out of the student movement. Yeah. And when you look at the lineage of people we've had come out of the student movement, that's really a bold statement to make. But this is the sentiment of so many. Sure. And um, Colin Powell, of course, going through um, City College, not being as academically um, blessed as Kwame was, right. but um, going through City College, eventually getting into the military, going through catching the heels of Korea, two tours in Vietnam, graduate of the National War College, ending up doing what he's done in the world, and Kwame Ture ending up doing what he did in the world, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, Honorary a Chairman of the Black Panther Party, um, Central Committee of the All-African People's Revolutionary you know, Party. If I can stop you right there because as an admirer of Stokely Carmichael, mm -hmm. Kwame Ture, uh -huh. I recently, I've just gone back and Googled him and, uh -huh. and, and, and looked at some of the YouTube stuff. Mm -hmm. In 1964 or thereabouts, mm -hmm. might have been 65, I, I, mm -hmm. I, I, I had to go back and take a look. Mm -hmm. Stokely Carmichael was in Mississippi mm -hmm. standing up with folks that were standing on the perimeter, mm -hmm. the policeman, mm -hmm. knowing that he was a target mm -hmm. and was standing up in that state that wasn't giving Fannie Lou Hamill or anybody else the right to vote without putting them through hell, mm -hmm. Kwame Ture was standing up and saying black power. Yes, 66. Now, to put that in mm -hmm. perspective, right. the kind of courage the kind of willingness to represent and fight for the liberation of his people, mm -hmm. knowing mm -hmm. that any second mm -hmm. he could get killed because he was speaking a truth to power that didn't have any problem killing you and throwing you in a swamp. And in the context of this play, um, many people talk about the slogan, Black Power, first coined by uh, Frederick Douglass, but popularized by Kwame Ture and Mukasa Dada, then known as Willie Ricks at that juncture. But they had two, SNCC had two slogans bolder than that. Hell no, we won't go. Absolutely. And victory to Ho Chi Minh. Mm -hmm. So they were saying not only did they, was the war in Vietnam wrong, an abomination, but they wanted the Vietnamese to emerge victorious. And what has been conveniently omitted from our history, Brother Rock, is that it was SNCC who push Dr. Martin Luther King to come out against Vietnam because their entrance into that effort is the assassination of Sammy Young Jr. in Tuskegee right. in January of 66, as you know. Right. And then he had just come a few years, medically discharged from the military, joining SNCC, shot in, uh, at Standard Oil gas station for using a white-only bathroom. And they were saying, if we can't um, fight in the... Uh, if we can't get treated like human beings in this country, why would we represent right. this country abroad? Right. Which, so, was, which certainly was the, and was the philosophy exactly. for why Muhammad Ali and, and didn't step forward. Exactly. Right. And SNCC and SELC provided the safety net. Right. And interestingly enough, when Kwame Ture, which he considered one of the biggest honors of his life, had audience with none other than Ho Chi Minh, it was Ho Chi Minh that told him Marcus Garvey's passion for Africa, as his birthday is tomorrow, uh, Marcus Garvey's passion for Africa made me realize I must have the same patriotism to Vietnam. And Ho Chi Minh spent time with Garvey in Harlem in the 20s, embraced the nationalist and pan-Africanist sentiment of Garvey, and applied it to the Vietnamese situation, and taught the people of Vietnam that the world won't be free till Africa's free. Yeah. So, of course, so we, and so, but at the same time, Colin Powell did two tours in Vietnam. Yeah. Kwame Ture was a friend of Maurice Bishop, for example, as we sit here on the 30th anniversary of his assassination. Colin Powell presented Ronald Reagan with the gun that assassinated Maurice Bishop. So we just wanted to show that how you have two people that grew up in the same neighborhood, four years apart, Colin Powell born in 1937, 
Kwame Ture, born in 1941, could be on two opposing sides of the spectrum. And as a community where we're discussing sporadic violence rooted in self-hatred, what's going on in Chicago, what's going on in Detroit, people who will not hesitate to condemn that or the Bloods and Crips in Los Angeles, they consider it a thing of, they consider it honorable for us to go to Africa and bomb Africa, go to Asia and bomb a Asia, go to Latin America and bomb Asia. And because Truman understanding the strategic um, ad advantages of desegregating the military, um, we got trapped and moved in that direction. And Kwame lets you know he did the same thing that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad did when they tried to force him into World War II. He did the same thing that A. Philip Randolph did when he spoke out against World War I. He did the same thing that Paul Robeson did, putting his career on the line, going from making $200,000 a year back then to around $6,000 a year because of his condemnation of U.S. foreign policy. And if we're going to be Pan-African like we talked about, all it simply means is we're no longer politically domesticated. Like like a cat is domesticated or a dog is domesticated. We want to be natural in the wild, if you will, and embrace who we really are. And real quickly, um, what I wanted to say is um, SNCC's headquarters were across the street from Ben's Chili Bowl. <laughs> right. And Kwame Ture used to always talk about the two places where he could always be fed That's right. was at, SN at Ben's and Florida Avenue Grill around the corner. Absolutely. So I thought it was, I would, I, I will, and I also will bring that up. I his, will bring that up his in the next other, hour. His other, um, play mother Annie Green down the street in yeah. Islander. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Always yes. took care of SNCC. Yeah. So yeah. When you fight for the people, the people feed you. <laughs> uh -huh. um, you know, I, I was in Libya. Um, and two of the most profound feelings that I had mm -hmm. was one that was extraordinarily surreal. When we got a call, we were watching CNN Mm -hmm. It was uh, it was when Michael Jackson passed away. I think that was 2009. Yeah. I think right. That was uh, that was a uh, June of 2009. Mm -hmm. Well, we were watching the events unfold on CNN mm -hmm. while one of his closest confidants and associates was calling the group that I was with. Wow. And we got the news that he was dead before it came across the wire on CNN, and wow. it was from the person. Mm -hmm. that was standing with Michael's lifeless body. Mm. And so I had, that was sort of being far away in the desert mm. and seeing this, you know, American entertainment icon, mm -hmm. hearing about his death before it became news was a really Twilight Zone surreal kind of experience. That was one feeling I had. Mm -hmm. The other, I visited CERT, mm -hmm. which where, um, um, uh, Muammar Gaddafi mm -hmm. had convened the Organization of African Unity. Right. And heads of states from all of the African countries were there. Mm -hmm. And they were talking about creating a currency mm -hmm. that would be rooted and secured by the earth, yes. by what's in the ground. Mm -hmm. And it for it to be the, comp the most secure and powerful economic force on the planet yes and the feeling that i had amongst other things amongst right. other things amongst very much relaxing the borders between con countries yes. on the continent of africa so their whole immigration idea is to become ultimately one africa exactly not just a conglomerate conglomerate of independent countries but one africa yes sir and the feeling that i had was that this will get you killed. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And I came back, and in a short time, mm -hmm. I saw things happen mm -hmm. where ultimately Gaddafi was killed and drawn through the streets. Now, the interesting thing about that is, um, and um, I've, when I was a student at UDC, before I graduated, we organized the press conference in this country that gave um, the Libyans an opportunity to give their take on um, the bombing in Lockerbie, Scotland. 
when it first became an issue. Yeah. So, but long before I dealt with the issue of Zimbabwe, around the same time we were doing work um, around South, what's called South Africa with the three liberation movements, their exiles here, work we were doing in Guinea, work we were doing around Somalia. We definitely did work in Libya, but interestingly enough, my point of reference to Libya is my father. Because my father, in addition to the work you talked about earlier, my father had the opportunity under the administration of Mutala Muhammad in Nigeria to be the director of ECBS, the national television station. Yes. And in the 1970s, Muammar Gaddafi organized a conference in Libya, and the theme of the conference was the role of media in the decolonization process. And he was talking about financing Africa having one central television station, right. one central radio station. Right. This is in the 70s right. now. We're talking right. 75, 76. Right. So people's sentiment was because he wanted to undertake that project, death would be at his doorstep. Yeah. So um, we, we had an idea when we saw him at um, the United Nations, the only time he ever came, and many people were wondering why he took two hours. They felt that he was grandstanding. But he was trying to convey a message to the world that he knew that he was next on the list. And even though the United States gave the impression that they wanted to normalize relations, uh, they had an intersection here in the Watergate Hotel. The Corporate Council on Africa had sent some businesses there in 2003 yeah. to try to develop a relationship. He already knew because, interestingly enough, when you go back to Nkrumah's time in power, when Nkrumah came to this country as the president of Ghana for the first time, the very first person to meet him at the airport was none other than Milton Hershey. He takes Nkrumah to uh, the Hershey plant in Pennsylvania. Yeah. You know, subliminally, sure. I want sure. access to your cocoa. I was going to say, and then, a something to do and with then, the cocoa. And then, <laughs> Brother Rock, when they drop Nkrumah back off in New York, guess what's there? A limo waiting to take him to the Waldorf Astoria because um, the New York Cocoa Board of Trade had a reception in his honor. So for any African head of state who is truly committed to their people and truly feels that the human resource must control the material resource, because one of the things you heard Kwame Ture say many times is the biggest contradiction of all is Africans are the poorest people in the world, yet we are products of the richest continent on earth. Yeah. So we know this is what happened to, um, why, what happened to Colonel Gaddafi happened. And at a time where the um, attacks on Zimbabwe intensify, Zimbabwe just found out a few years ago they have 25% of the world's diamonds. Yeah. And they have the distinction of being the only country in Africa ever to be accused of blood diamonds where there is no war or there is no military conflict. Yeah. But the same way we're not going to let Global Witness have the last word on blood diamonds, because they're not going to talk about Oppenheimer and De Beers and the Anglo-American Corporation, the true bandits when it comes to the question of diamonds. Ovi, they always say, leave your audience waiting for more and wanting more. I'm telling you, man, we could go on, but unfortunately Definitely. the clock has hey. put us up against the wall. We've got to, man, we've got to go so out. Much, thank man. you so and very I, much. And I sincerely and hope that the time we spent together, you, you were pleased as the host and your listeners are pleased. This is a very, we, a very we informative and I'm all, pleased. All the time. Back in a moment with the matriarch from Ben's Chili Bowl celebrating 55 years of love and half smoke and feeding po folks like Bill Cosby and Kwame Ture and Barack Hussein Obama. You're going to talk to her next on The Rock Newman Show. Rock Newman Show.